Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. This is episode number 199, featuring an interview with Jedediah French, co-editor of The Art and Science of Initiation, recently published by Lewis Masonic. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to chamberofreflection.com, our membership site. Anathema Publishing Limited, Quality Occult Books and Contemporary Esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian Theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, the Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Brother Jedediah French is a founding member of Templum Rose Lodge number 863 in Oakland, California. His articles have been published in Masonic books and periodicals, including Philolaths, the Journal of Masonic Research and Letters, The Plumb Line, and The Square. He won the Award of Literature for 2016 for his article in Philolaths. He blogs occasionally at Esoteric Freemasonry and the Western Mystery Tradition. I really love the art and science of initiation. Jedediah French and Angel Millar have done a brilliant job putting it together. I highly recommend it. I also had a great time interviewing Jedediah, having known him for some time and following his work over the years. It's been wonderful to watch him grow, and it's really my pleasure to bring you this interview with him where we discuss his work on this essential new book. You can order the Art and Science of Initiation directly from Lewis Masonic's website at www.lewismasonic.co.uk. And you can find Jedediah French online at skfrench.wordpress.com. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos. And the outro music is The Initiation by Adam Fielding. Jedediah French, it is an absolute honor and uh, pleasure to speak with you uh, today. Thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you for having me on. I've been listening to the show for a long time, going on like 10 years, I think. So it's it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I know you've been uh, a listener and a supporter of the show for a long time, and I appreciate that very much. And it's really been, as I said earlier before we started, that it's been a real pleasure to watch your career and the things you work on and um, how you present the material. And it's just, it's really great. And uh, I think you're right. I think this is a good time to connect and and talk about your work more yeah yeah thank you um one thing about the show that i would just want to say is that as the show has developed over the years and i've been following it it also has acted as a kind of 
catalyst and like education source. And I'm sure this is true for a lot of your, your listeners, but um, I've definitely learned a ton about what at the esoteric is, what, you know, magic is or is not uh, just from listening to all of the great guests that you've interviewed over the years and the kinds of questions you've asked them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's really been a true journey of discovery for me as well. So I'm really grateful that other people have learned from it and um, it's definitely wonderful to sort of see it come full circle and be able to talk to you today. So it, it's really makes it all very meaningful to me. Great. Yeah. For me as well. Cool. Um, well, you've done something amazing that deserves uh, to be discussed. So that's one of the reasons we're getting together. Uh, but before we talk about your the book that you've just put out, just um, let us let everyone know if you don't mind. Just at, and you can be as general or specific as you want. But like, where are you speaking to us from today? Uh, well, today I'm speaking to you from uh, Germany, sort of um, like about an hour from Berlin or so by train. Wonderful. So, yeah, it's uh, darker here than it is where you are, I think. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really excellent. And so, and you've gotten the chance to see some wonderful things in your travels. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I really enjoyed a lot is um, traveling as a Freemason because the experience of um, seeing Masonic ritual in other countries and also of fraternizing with brothers in countries other than the U.S. has really just expanded my mind in ways that I don't think I ever would have been able to do if I had not been a Freemason. Excellent. Yeah. It's also, it's also a big, uh, particularly for uh, Masons in the United States, it's, I think it should be, I think lodges should just have kind of crucial field trips where they fly them all <laughs> to Europe or to, I don't know, South America or something to have them experience Masonry in other countries because it's uh, a quite an, an eye opener. And you lo start to learn about some of the things that are better uh, in other countries and then some of the things that the united states also uh freemasonry in the united states has going for it but of course the united states has a, its own sort of unique expression of, of freemasonry that uh a lot of masons I, I think maybe even newer masons just sort of take for granted so when you go travel travel abroad and then experience freemasonry in other contexts it is a real important education experience i think that's really true I mean, I have not experienced it abroad, but I think you're right. When you go to other lodges, other jurisdictions, other states, and certainly other countries, it's really an eye opener. Mm -hmm. um, it's wonderful. I'm really happy and that you have this uh, opportunity. So it's great. Yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I, like I said, I've just learned a ton from doing this. Well, um, I hope um, we can all learn a lot from you t today in this discussion because uh, you've you've just um, recently um, had this this book that you've worked on so much, um, the art and science of initiation, um, from you, Jedediah French, as well as Angel Millar, who was just recently on the program. Um, it's been put out by Lewis Masonic. Uh, this collection of essays that you've edited and curated and written in a brilliant, brilliant introduction to, I think. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's really impressive. I can't express enough how much I enjoy the book. And I know I'm biased, obviously, because my article is one of those that's included here. So I can't be impartial, but I, I really love what you've done with this collection. And I honestly 
when we were corresponding and you were editing my article, I had really no clear indication exactly of what the the collection would be or <laughs> the thrust of the introduction and the way you're presenting these. So I think it is real, really well done and timely and important. So, um, but I'll let you talk more about it. So maybe we can start by talking about what is your intention behind putting this book out, this collection? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about it. Like, like you said, it's, I've been working on it for two, three years uh, with Angel Millar and I did, well, both Angel and I did reach out to a lot of authors that we admired and wanted to see in the book and you were one of them. And when, as we were going through that process, it wasn't clear exactly how we were going to organize it, even though we did have a, a central um, kind of guiding vision. It wasn't until we got some of the finished essays that we were able to um, structure it more the way that it currently is. But uh, maybe I'll get to that a little bit later. To, I guess where to start with this would be after joining Freemasonry, which happened for me alongside listening to your program, where you started to get also more interested in Masonry and having interviewing more Masons. And so I was kind of going along this journey at a similar time, which I also think is interesting. But anyway, after I got my third degree, I became really, really active. And I got to experience a lot of the both um, drawbacks that I started to see, I guess, in the fraternity, at least drawbacks for me, as well as the things that I just couldn't have quite possibly imagined before actually going through the, the rituals myself. Like I had some kind of preconceived ideas about it that were um, not exactly, <laughs> it was in some ways less, but also much, much more than what I thought it would be. So that was an interesting process in and of itself. But because I'm a writer and an editor and I read just all the time, that's, that's what I do. When I joined the Lodge, there was partly, a, um, at least initially, a lack of people I could have intellectual discussions with about Freemasonry. And I know sort of the point was to get around the intellectual part and have an experience of sort of fraternity and giving back to the community and uh, self-development through ritual initiation. I mean, that is the point, which I still think that is the point. But because of my own temperament, I'm a bit of a bookish guy. So I really wanted to talk about books and talk about ideas uh, that were more philosophical or aesthetic that I was thinking about and, and experiencing and seeing in the rituals. Uh, over time, I definitely met more Masons and other lodges that focused on other things that were doing more of this. And when I got more involved in California Freemasonry, there was a, a, a big focus on that. So I definitely found a lot of that uh, kind of stuff in, in, in California uh, Masonry. But anyway, it was it, along that process, I just had the idea that I wanted to produce a book um, that Masons could, well, first of all, that I could talk about with other Masons and maybe get them to read, but also that Masons that I didn't know could use to to sort of get an entry point into some more of the complex intellectual ideas that the fraternity offers without like robbing it of its experiential core. Because one thing I definitely have also noticed in Freemasonry, and I sort of hinted at this in the introduction maybe is, it can also be just be turned into sort of like an intellectual armchair, uh, who knows the most weird number symbolism things or something. And I, I guess you probably find this in a lot of esoteric quarters. And that's sort of more, what it's more like to be in an, in an academic context where it's just about how much you know. So I, I don't necessarily want the fraternity to be something like that, but I was, I, I was hoping to figure out a way to find a middle point. And I thought that I had been thinking for a long time that a book would be a way, for me at least, to kind of hash that out. What would a middle point look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, um, that was like I, where the start of the whole uh, project came from I had had some experiencing in publishing so I I worked out a proposal this was over 
you know, like, like I said, this was over like a couple years. It was just kind of like a, something I was working on, but I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. So I, I drew up a proposal and then the next kind of step of maybe I'd make this thing a reality is I had been following Angel Millar's work and I really enjoyed that. And I first was introduced to him on your show mm -hmm. actually. And I just thought he had some really interesting, unique things to say about Freemasonry and they didn't come off as um, a bunch of, of sort of fact, <laughs> fact rapid fire or something. Right. And so I was like, hmm, he seems to be a really interesting thinking dude. So I reached out to him to see if he wanted to, to work on a project together and he was interested. And so we, we talked on the phone, uh, like on Skype or something a couple of times and we kind of came up with an initial plan and it changed a little bit over time. But that, that was the original part of it is, is hooking up with Angel and then us working on this prospectus together and coming up with a plan of like, okay, who do we want in this book and what is like our mission statement of the book? And that was the prospectus that I eventually contacted Martin Fox at Lewis Masonic and sent him this prospectus. And Martin has been super awesome at Lewis and he kind of went to bat for the book, I think, with Lewis Masonic because this is not the kind of book they they publish normally. They do publish books that are more into these kinds of themes, but it isn't like the regular type of book. So I think one of the reasons why Lewis picked this up was because of Martin. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think this is uh, stretching their you know, comfort zone a little bit. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's it's really asking important questions it's putting forth interesting ideas ways to think about things um so i it, it's really just so brilliant in the way that it's uh framed and the context is presented and the need for it like all coming together in this um just total symbiotic union it's, so i like that yeah and i think that probably when i was not at the, the meeting where martin presented it to the other uh the board members of lewis or, or whatever but i'm sure that they he probably talked about it in this context and, and all over even when you're traveling to uh, at least for me traveling to european countries there's a similar feeling in freemasonry too that it's like oh, okay this old guard is sort of going away the old world seems to be sliding away underneath our feet everywhere and this is also true of masonry and uh but then you have a bunch of young people who are also joining it having us different kinds of interests so i think that they also saw the the kind of timeliness of it and that's probably why it was also picked up yeah so brilliant um okay so um what are some of the i guess I don't, I, I want to be careful with my language here. Hmm. Um, from your own experience with Masonic initiation, um, you know, it seems like there's things that maybe you've noticed that other people have noticed and discussed with you um, to sort of like, bring through this uh, desire to address it in a book form. Um, and, and I feel it as well. I mean, but I don't, I don't want to like put words in your mouth either. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, everyone who's gone through the degrees, if they've been, you know, had any kind of self-awareness, they probably felt something similar to that. So maybe you can, and talk about that a little bit yeah i guess um well <clears throat> the, the book re reflects that just in in my interest so I, there's a kind of a personal answer for that and there's a book related the book related answer i suppose i'll do both the book related answer is if you look at the table of contents in there it's not just all written by masons or something it's um it's quite an eclectic mix of individuals writing and that was the point too that some of the what's in there and some of the authors in there are books that i think people have read before joining freemasonry thinking it might be related to these like larger esoteric 
mythologies or something, or these big sort of spiritual ambitions. And then there's also the more like grounded kind of research work, which not so many people who haven't joined the Freemason fraternity read that stuff per se. Uh, so the author list is kind of trying to already give this these more grandiose ideas attention as as a, in the Masonic context, as well as this more grounded research, which has been also going on for a long time and is super important, particularly now where Freemasonry is um, being decried on the internet and all sorts of interesting conspiratorial projects. So both of those things are, are important, but so, so that's why the, this idea continued to uh, germinate with me. And it was the personal answer for this is as I was meeting more and more Masons and I got really active after I got my third degree and I, I would talk to a lot of people who are interested in quote unquote esoteric subjects, partly because maybe they were looking for other people to talk about it and weren't finding someone and I of course was all into this and we usually would be talking about it so they ended up asking me questions or we just ended up talking more about it but I also started to like the I saw a lot of people young people coming in young men and getting their third degree and getting raised and having a really profound experience but then sort of wandering off afterwards hardly and then I had some of them I don't want to say exactly what they told me but to be general, the, the the sentiment that would be expressed a lot of the time is something like, "Okay, this is is this it? Like, where is the where is the sort of next step? Like these? Oh yes, these rituals were extremely important to me. The, I love my brothers, and then what? And I think when the the, the and then what was hardly based on a like me a, pre a preconceived notion about what is the fraternity supposed to be doing. And a lot of the times, if you read these more um, grandiose mythologies about the you know highly idealized accounts of what Freemasonry's mission is in the world and what it where it comes from and all this, you have a very big uh, very big shoes to fill. So I, what I wanted to do was to some of these people that I talked to ended up leaving just leaving I guess just because it wasn't ended up not being for them. Or sometimes I've also noticed this more recently. Sometimes they just went way down the rabbit hole in the kind of S and the occult direction, which is also, in my opinion, spiraling away from what Freemasonry is. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I was trying to sort of sh have a way to show them, like, yes, it's in one sense there's a mundane aspect to fratern to the fraternity, but it and it isn't what is in those these certain kinds of books or even what you, whatever you've watched on YouTube or something. But uh, at the same time, there is something extremely unique and um, uh, powerful. And I would even go far to say, so far to say that something you're not going to find anywhere else. So, so, and that part of it had was is rich enough that you can get out of that part of it if you really dive into it and explore it. What it is you think you're not being handed right away in the lodge. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. But that, that was sort of what I was experiencing, talking to a lot of brothers and being really active and sort of feeling this sort of tug and uh, tug uh, about wanting more esoteric. And then the tug of the, of the, the guys who had been doing this for the last 50 years. And they're like, this is not what we do. We do these other things. What are you talking about? And then this sort of clash in the lodge room, which is uh, from a sociological perspective is just fascinating to watch. But over the last, like I've been a Mason six, seven years, over the last six, seven years, there has been a change. And, and another, an additional, um, an additional part of that I experienced in California. In California, there was, there, there I felt um, kind of three strands here. One strand is the guys who have been doing this for the last 30, 40 years. And it's a very important part of their social life and, and spiritual life, even if they don't talk about it. Like, you could tell that it is important for them. They're just not talking about it in terms of number symbolism or something like this. But then you have guys who got, who just going down the esoteric rabbit hole and, and like wanting to make the Masonic Lodge uh, meet in black robes every single meeting or, or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had a third strand, which was really, which, which was really um, 
important in my in my development, and this was the the scholarly pursuit. And so, like at the UC, at UCLA, they have this symposium every year where the Grand Lodge of California and the UCLA History Department, which has a Masonic Studies kind of minor or something, would get together and hold this conference where academics get up and speak about the history of Freemasonry, and then Masons would get up also and speak about the history of Freemasonry. So, and also working with um, Sean Iyer of the um, um, uh, Philolades Journal. He also, this was, all, I also learned a lot working with him. I published several articles there. So the, his, so the actual historical element of it is also uh, very important. And also, I think one of the things that California was trying to do, why there's this emphasis in the Grand Lodge of California on proper historical research methods is to, to sort of like make clear that really the history of Freemasonry in and of itself is powerful enough and has enough richness there to give you any kind of uh, um, like more aesthetic kind of a uh, spiritual, I hate to use the word, but esoteric stuff. Like it's there in the history as long as you approach it and you can approach it with the right historical methods and you will find all of this stuff there. So <clears throat> anyway, to, to wrap that part up, in, once I got to California, I kind of saw these three strands sort of clashing together. <clears throat> and again, that also just, you know, guided my thinking about uh, what this book could be about. Like, how would you, how could one possibly bring all this together? And, and in talking with Angel with it, he's, of course, experienced a lot of the same stuff. And he's been doing this for longer than I have. And so he had a similar idea in the book as an attempt to, to try to stitch all those seemingly like competing interests together into something for everyone. Yeah, no, you definitely succeeded in that. Um, one of the other things that uh, I think stands out and you draw attention to in your introduction as well is this sort of tension between the traditional and the modern, and you've mentioned that already. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your own exploration of these ideas and maybe your own opinions about what you think is. Uh, like if you were in charge of, you know, what would be the best direction forward? If I was in charge of Freemasonry? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad I'm not actually just thinking about that for about a second. I was like, oh God. Yeah, right. It's a little too much, I think. <laughs> but, but, well, and one of the things I like about Freemasonry is that it's a, a whole that is composed of a bunch of interconnected parts and the parts are in some ways doing their own thing. I really like that about Freemasonry. Um, so there is no kind of no le leader of it per se, although the, perhaps the ritual and structure is, is the leader. Um, well, the answer for this, like, I don't know, I don't want to, um, this might be where some people, whoever is on one side or the other would take offense at, at my answer, but I can only speak personally for me. And, and this is a, another central point in the book of like, is masonry a sort of orthodox traditional institution or is it a modernizing not subversive but mm, progressive that's the way to put it modernizing progressive institution and this of course is you, usually the way this is put in the scholarship is oh the united grand lodge of england is the orthodox conservative uh the you know the older freemasonry and then the grand orient in france is the quote-unquote liberal freemasonry and that is a largely i think a, a um an invention of the scholars in france who, who sort of put it that way and i'm not sure that all you know united grand lodge of england freemasons necessarily would want to talk about it that way but but in some way that kind of works that distinction but at the same time, okay, are they two different Freemasonries then? And are we then forced to speak about Freemasonries in the plural? And that's without even taking into account fringe masonry and quote unquote fringe masonry and all the other um, rights and you know, defunct rights and that are still sort of going on, but not like without even taking them in, into account, like what, whatever they're doing. Um, but so, for me, 
the traditionalist view of Freemasonry, the, this sort of uh, notion that Freemasonry is meant to anchor us to a past way of, 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 of being in a past way that societies are supposed to be structured and that Freemasonry is trying to make sure we don't go away from that or bring us back to it. That's not necessarily my view of Freemasonry, even though I do think that it has safeguarded something from the past that is, is very important, if, if for the very least to give a person a good, clear perspective. I mean, when I went through my degrees, I did feel like for a few seconds there, I had been like transported back three, 400 years ago. And I was getting a kind of whiff of the essence of what uh, the world was like three, 400 years ago, which is we can talk about it and read it in books and look at artifacts, of course, but you can't experience it. You only can look at it secondhand. But there was a couple moments in the ritual where I, I sort of felt transported for a second. And it was like, wow, this is how uh, people viewed the world um, then. And this is a little bit more what it felt like, what it smelled like. It was like a, an affective, sensual quality. So, it, so, and that was useful for me because I got to see just how different uh, th things have become. But at the same time, a lot of what the ritual talked about seemed to be a forward looking uh, vision also. And then when you look at the history of the fraternity, you do see it having just a tremendous role in so-called modernizing efforts. This, this uh, in traditionalist circles and a lot of the spiritual, spiritual circles or esoteric groups or whatever, frequently this term modern is kind of demonized as, a, as like, really I think what they mean is almost postmodern or relativist philosophy. But for me, that's not necessarily what I mean when I think it is more aiming in the modernizing direction. I mean, I lean more towards even in a futurist perspective that Freemasonry is a kind of a, more of a guide for building a future world rather than sort of trying to bring us back to a world that shouldn't have been lost or dismantled to some kind of hierarchical world, even though it functions, it's a hierarchy. And the history does reflect that. I mean, there's a, a great book that just came out called The Occult Features of Anarchism, which I was reading, and it's very interesting uh, connections between the early history of Marxism and Freemasonry. So, the, and in, like Angel Malar's written about this in, in non European countries, Freemasonry is used as a kind of like tool for change in the society. So I think there's a huge tension there and, and I'm sympathetic to both sides really, but if I had to, for me, if I, if I had to decide like, what am I doing with Freemasonry? What do I think it's useful for? I'm more, my eyes are looking more towards the future rather than the past. And that's why I put in the, the end of my introduction, this kind of idea about robotics and engineering and the future world that is sort of being built around us. And what does Freemasonry have to say about that? And if you look at the history of Freemasonry, they were quite involved with the advancements in, in technology. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And I also think that the language you use in the introduction, you talk about the world in crisis, the duty of Masons. I like how you put it here. It's our contention that Masons should not become better than better men, but the best. So these ideas are not, they're not like a, a, an investigation into some, you know, interesting topic. It's like uh, eminently practical and almost like a call to arms in, in a way, which I think, you know, most people, feel in some form or another or and maybe in multiple ways and i'm just curious if you want to talk a little bit about how you believe that freemasons who are truly uh, masters of the craft are able to serve that role in, in society yeah and see that's where uh, all and all of my idealizing is it's a not a brick wall but that's where the the rubber hits the road or whatever and that, that of course i don't have a, a great answer for because the the idealizing part is much more easier to formulate for me and it is something i'm passionate about and that's why it comes across that way in the introduction but luckily i don't think that um i necessarily need to provide an answer for that because i think the the rituals themselves 
function in that way. And if I think about what are the rituals trying to do, they're trying to make a person spiritually developed and spiritually um, and psychologically aware. And at the same time, uh, when they're standing there at the temple or the sangha or the, the monastery, ready to devote their life to this spiritual practice, Freemason returns them around and says, go back out into society. So I think that there's something in it about um, self-development and social development, being able to uh, work in symbiosis and being able to do both at once rather than it being in either or. And I guess that's what I mean. So if a person were to go into Freemasonry and use its tools and its rituals to genuinely Im improve themselves, come become aware of their deficiencies, their rough ashlar or whatever, and work on, uh, it's, you know, it's more Buddhistic in this kind of a sense of like, how can I do the least amount of harm and how can I stop myself from doing harm at all costs and always serve what I perceive as the good? How can I do that in society um, around people who are getting more and more agitated, particularly in the United States, because of intense pressures coming from the government, coming from advanced technology and coming from climate change? and coming from inequality. So, so I think that the more masonry can produce individuals who can do that, and, and I think to some extent, it's different in the in historical context, because obviously then is different than now, but very generally speaking, you can see a little bit of some people in masonry trying to do that. And um, I think it can be kind of put, put, a, put forward again that that is, main aim of, of masons is to do both of these things at once mm -hmm. it isn't just charity it isn't just how many magic numbers symbolism things can i m memorize but it is both actually well and i guess as i hear myself talking the part of the reason i i think like that is because of these experiences i told you about with these other masons guys sometimes my own age sometimes younger sometimes maybe older also who joined the freemasonry and went in one direction or the other Mm -hmm. So my mother lodge, uh, not my mother lodge, but one of the lodges that I was uh, involved with before and the one that I is, I'm now a member of in Oakland that I helped found, both of these lodges were, had gone into the typical Blue Lodge uh, as you find it in America after 1945, before 1990 type feeling, I guess. And then had reacted to that into a traditional observance lodge and then had started to experience the the um sometimes nastier politics of those types of lodges i guess and then it sort of retreated backwards halfway to try to find a middle point hmm. so i think from some of those from just being around masons who that was kind of their experience a lot this has also formulated some of my thinking of like well it's not really one of the others. These people don't have it wrong. This group of Masons don't necessarily have it wrong. This other group don't necessarily have it wrong. They both seem to be kind of missing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. Um, I think partly because of who you are and the way you think and observe things and that you're able to verbalize and really explain things that a lot of us have encountered in our Masonic travels. But, but I think it's interesting because your desire to sort of bring all of these things together in a conversation in the form of a book actually somewhat like breaks the tension in a way that's like, well, at least we can like have a conversation about it. Like, and we could just have a conversation in a book and it doesn't get so invested in people's feelings and desires about how things are supposed to be or not supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, I think that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah, and I think that the reason for that to some extent is where my, what were my tools that I had. And I, my tools were knowing about writing, knowing about um, how to edit and how to, to uh, produce a book. So that's kind of like my, was my go-to. It's also what I'd love to do. <clears throat> but at the same time, the book, <clears throat> I mean, Masons do love their books and so do like 
people who are interested in esotericism or spiritual traditions, you, typically these people really like books. So oh, yeah. um, a book is a good, good medium in and of itself for people like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, before we talk about some of your own uh, other work and research, um, I was just from my own experience, I was really impressed with the, your editing abilities and your attention to detail. And, um, and as you said, like the way you're, you've sort of enforced, well, that's a kind of a harsh word, but um, you've kind of had set the standard here with the academic style um, notations and sourcing in the book, which I think is important in this type of subject. Um, and, and it, it, I guess it kind of uh, puts forth like a discipline of scholarship that you don't always find when this subject is discussed. So I feel like that's kind of refreshing in a lot of ways. Yeah, thank, thank you. I'm glad that that shows because, I mean, that was definitely um, part of the intention as well. And like we, you know, when you read Angel's books, he is like an independent researcher, but he's very good at it. And he, he definitely does uh, proper research, you know. So both he and I, when we were talking about this, I think it was just kind of went unsaid that it needed to be at a certain level of scholarship and research to... Um, to, to, to fly now the, but the the problem with that is uh, a lot of times people who are writing from an experiential perspective that's not their main focus and they're not trained in it or nor should they care you know mm -hmm. but at that point it's up to the editor to be able to take something like that and not destroy its um, heart quality maybe we say it like that but at the same time it can't be just like looking like a you know a jumbled Wikipedia post blog thing or something. It has to it has to ring. The words have to ring true. It has to be structured well. It has to be phrased well. And if there are, and certain parts of it do need footnotes. Now, like with the articles, the, the, some of the last articles in the book are just written by people who write esoteric history. This is like Mark Booth's essay and also Donald Tyson. And these people just write books on magic. And they use footnotes and everything, but they're not necessarily trying to produce a, a work of like historical, like a hist you know a history book. Even though they're doing a history, and they are showing us things in the past that are, you know, it depends. Sometimes yes, well, m almost usually they're pointing to something that's an actual historical event, but then they unpack that to show all of these other aspects of it that are come from a more that seem to come from a more mythological or spiritual perspective. And so with something like that, there was a challenge in maintaining that voice, but then also trying to show how that can also be done while also conforming to these more rigorous uh, like academic techniques. And on the other side, we didn't want anything too, too like, and that was that was also hard like nothing that was it was too academic and was readable for the, the average mason and their average person who just wanted to pick it up and read it mm -hmm. and this this goes in a little bit into why the book is structured the way it is and this was apparent after we got some of the more of the the essays in in their finished form and angel and i decided to like break it up into a part one and a part two so part one of the book is called the science of initiation by science there, I don't mean, we don't mean laboratory work. We mean uh, science in terms of like history supposedly has science and social, social science. Like, so this, this academic method as, as, as a science, supposedly, we could argue about that. But they like to call it a science. At the very least, it's systematic. Whereas the other, the second half of the book is called um, the art of initiation. So we broke it into these two sections and the art of initiation is, not just painting or just uh, creating stories, but sort of artistic uh, perception of history and of Masonic history. 
which is kind of like mythology, but that's not all it is. It's, in a lot more ways, it's a, it's a personal experience that informs uh, the past. And that's trickier. I guess the way I would like to just wrap on that for a second is the more I thought about it as we were putting together that part of the book, what, that I think when some people go, if, if a person reads, let's say, Manly P. Hall's The Secret History or The Secret Doctrine, whatever, what is his book called? The History, The Teachings of All Ages. Yeah. If, they read, if they read through this book, then they go and join Freemasonry. They might have a very profound experience, even if they're having crappy carpet from the 70s and light fixtures that don't work so well and, you know, something like that. And, and guys who are not interested in Manly P. Hall at all, they might still have some kind of experience that is super transformative for them. And I think I, that this does happen a lot. And, and why is that happening? It's happening partly from the ritual, but as they're going through the ritual, they're connecting it up, this artistic perception of the past that they first came across in reading Manly P. Hall's book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if a person wanted to be, a person on the, you know, Mr. Rigorous academic side would want to be really harsh or negative about that, they would say that this person is having kind of a false, um, something false is happening there and they're, they're, they're not, and it's true that if from historically they're, they're not seeing history the way history quote unquote is, but they are having an artistic um, in, encounter with, with, um, with a, a perception of certain perception of history that is more artistic and that is having a transformative effect on them. So I think that's also an important part. And I don't think that part should be just tossed out because some things that, you know, Manly Hall talked about in his book are not, historically nailed down or just straight up fantasy or something. That's not really the point. Particularly, I would think like a lot of the ritual is not histor is deliberately ahistorical, you know, and what's that about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think yeah. it's got a mythopoetic quality to it. And uh, it's, it's demonstrating concepts that, uh, don't require historical fact to back them up really that's not the point of it like you mm -hmm. said so yeah, it's it's fascinating um because we you talked about traditionalism a little bit and masonry and um and because i think i think angel writes about it in the article he submitted this idea of counter initiation um do you have any thoughts about that is is that present anywhere in your radar of esoteric activity mm, yeah i mean it's funny because there's a lot of traditionalism in this book but i'm not necessarily a traditionalist mm -hmm. i'm very sympathetic to their ideas but i'm also sympathetic to the modern occult revival people of that Mm -hmm. thing and this is again me of sort of looking at both sides and trying to find a balance point i i think there probably i think there is counter initiation i don't always think it's the same way that Gainan characterized it i don't necessarily think theosophy and what it was doing in 1890 was counter initiation i think that it, a lot of people did gain a kind of uh, spiritual initiation through that um, I don't think it was ritual initiation necessarily, though. It, it might have been something kind of different. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like in Jocelyn Godwin's article in the book, he talks about his uh, his own experiences reading Paul Brunton and with um, Tony uh, Damiani in New York. And his uh, his whole thing is about how is initiation possible outside of a hierarchical structure and is it, you know, or how is it possible without, without a ritual? I think maybe this is more of his point. Uh, and this is more of just looking at philosophy itself, which is, you know, development of ideas is that, can that produce initiation? And I think it can actually, I don't think that uh, it has to be, the rituals are not necessary. They're useful and interesting, but, I mean, really what can produce initiation is death, you know, encounter with, with death uh, on a very real, in a re very real way. And whether that's death of a loved one or death of a, of a part of you that you really identify with, 
or death in a, in a ritualistic context where they throw you in a box for a while or something. But it doesn't have to be, like I'm not, this sort of rigidity that the traditionalists put on lineages and on uh, like a ritual, what the ritual needs to be, how it needs to be performed. I think that it's true. I think that if you go through those ones, you are going to get a real initiation, but I, I don't think it's only that. I think because of this is, again, my kind of forward looking esotericism, I suppose, which I'm trying to, to, to formulate within myself. I think also there is a, a kind of progression, uh, not maybe not progression, but there's definitely a change in uh, uh, conditions in which human beings are born into uh, in different lifetimes. And when they are born into these conditions at different times, perhaps uh, the means by which something like initiation can be achieved are also different. And I don't know how we could know that or not. So it doesn't mean the old ones don't work anymore. I just think there's also new ones. And so the, the artistic part of it, uh, this is my kind of forward looking one that this, there can be an initiation through an artistic personal experience. And this is more like what the modernists were doing, these modern occultists. And with them, I'm thinking of like Rudolf Steiner. I'm thinking of, of Kandinsky. I'm thinking of, I, I guess, Crowley also, but he sort of his own thing all at the same time. But these people who are identified as modernists, which is really also ironic to me because Evola, he's sort of like, you know, like these other guys are in this modernist movement and they're just painting a picture of a different modernity, perhaps. But, but the modern art, the modern occult art um, movement, beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, I think that that also can produce a, a type of initiation that is not necessarily tied to, it doesn't have to be tied to anything going back through these initiatic chains. Yeah, maybe I could just do a quick kind of rundown of what's, what's in the book. Okay, great. All right. It's, yeah, it's, what if by all means go through it. Yeah, and so, like I said before, that when Angel and I started talking about it, we prepared this prospectus together, and then we started emailing authors that we wanted to get involved, including yourself, and the reason I wanted to, uh, and, and Angel as well, the reason why we wanted to bring you in on this is just because of all of the great insights that we've gotten from your show, and, and I've read some of your stuff that, since you were doing your, your graduate work, you've been kind of writing more. And so we just thought that it would be a, that would be a perfect fit. But there was a, a kind of calculated, um, just, it was a calculated selection of authors. And we didn't get all of them, but we got most of the ones that we wanted. And then we decided that I was thinking of writing an essay in it, and Angel was going to write it as well. But we kind of decided to, well, I'll do the introduction and maybe handle a little bit more of the heavy-handed editorial duties. And then he would provide his own a full essay and then also the cover art as well as assist with all the editorial stuff and we both worked with the authors and so forth so it kind of developed quite organically which which was pretty cool but that's why my introduction is a little bit different than the articles in it um and then <clears throat> once we got all the articles we kind of structured it in this way of these the science of initiation and the art of initiation and then i approached martin fox with uh, Lewis and he, he liked it and he, he pitched it for us. And he also helped us come up with a new title. So Martin also helped helped us a lot with this. So I, I really am thankful to him as well. And I kind of hope to do perhaps more stuff with Lewis in the future. Oh, that'd be great. <clears throat> yeah, and they the, the book is, is also really nice. I mean, they Angel's artwork on the cover looks great and the just the production of it, I'm, I'm also really pleased with. Yeah, they did a nice job. Yeah, so the, the science of initiation part has a lot of this traditionalism focus. And so Angel Millar, Richard Smoley, and uh, there's a long article by Timothy Scott, who's an academic who's written on kind of perennialism and traditionalism in that sense. And the idea there was not that we are thinking that traditionalism is the science of initiation, but the chapter is kind of a mix of traditional, the, the section is a mix of traditionalism and I guess just more of a kind of academic historical inquiry into a certain aspect of initiation. But the traditionalism part is there mostly to get um, to get a sense of, because they talk that the, the, perennial, perennial, the traditionalists and later perennialists talk so much about initiation that we felt that it was important 
that needs to be an, a large part of it. And just to get a grasp of how did they talk about initiation and think about it, because we felt that that would be useful. Whether or not we accepted all of it isn't really the point. The point was just to get an understanding of it. Um, then Susanna Ackerman um, contributed an essay on early Swedish uh, female Freemasonry and the, these two feminine rites that were started right away in Freemasonry after King Carl the Thirteenth restructured the Swedish rite into something that's really interesting and that I'm, I'm fascinated with, and I had the pleasure of going and visiting it and so forth. And so, her, I, I really did want. Um, I had two female authors lined up at first, but one of them had to couldn't contribute unfortunately because of other um, work projects but I really did want to, I just didn't want a, a TOC just of all men even though the subject was Freemasonry so mm -hmm. I was very happy to get Susanna Ackerman's essay in here and it's really interesting to read this was a regular female Masonic rite set up by the, the king for his his wife and uh, it's very interesting to read some about the rituals there and then Adam Kendall talks about his time working at the museum in um, in California and the importance of, of objects, which I also think is, a, is, a, is an important essay. And then we have your essay talking about this historical aspect of initiation in a kind of ancient pagan context. So that's the, 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 the science part of it. And then for the art part, it kind of just takes a totally other direction. And there's personal accounts by Jocelyn Godwin and Herbie Brennan of their initiations, either by meeting an influential person and um, this is when, to get back to your question a little while ago when you were asking me if I thought there is counter initiation, I, I think there can be. And it can be, Jocelyn's account is of a positive uh, waking up from meeting a kind of charismatic guru teacher, teacher guy. But that can also go south, you know, and it has for a lot of people. So I think in, sometimes in those contexts, a person who claims to have some kind of spiritual insight and wants to help you, but maybe isn't fully aware of all of their own. Uh, intentions, deep will instincts that they haven't quite figured out or, or aren't aware of. In some cases that can produce a kind of counter initiation, I think. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in Jocelyn's case, it's a, he is a very, for him and for me too, because I met a teacher that was very important in my development. And that can also work very well to have a teacher. I mean, it worked for me and it works in Jocelyn's case, the teacher can be the initiator outside of a, a lineage. You can just be a teacher at, at a college even. Um, and then there's an essay by Jeffrey Kupperman on thinking about um, theurgy and the third degree, which is also really interesting. And he and I got to talk, talking about this when we were, he was, there's an, I don't want to, probably shouldn't talk about it on air, but there's an aspect of the third degree that seems to be one way, but it's kind of isn't. And he pointed that out. And I thought that that was really interesting and I asked him to write a, uh, an essay on it, and that essay is called um, Raised in His Image, The Death and Non-Resurrection of Hiram of Biff in the Life of a Master Mason. So he, he draws on some of his Neoplatonic and theurgy knowledge to, to talk about that. And then Chuck Dunning has an essay on contemplation and ritual initiation, which is uh, also really important and where he interviews Masons who have brought meditation into their initiation experience. And the final three are probably the most seemingly kind of away from the normal Masonic uh, book. And this is Mark Booth in his Initiations, Light and Dark. And he, of course, wrote The Secret History of the, of the World and this is the follow-up, The Sacred History of the World. And in this one, he's talking about, he's giving a kind of outline of, an, of if you were to take this grand mythopoetic approach that like Manly P. Hall takes, what is initiation's role in that view, that perception of history? And Richard Kaczynski talks about um, Alistair Crowley's uh, use of initiation within the Order Templi Orientis and what, how does it function and what, what, what is it supposed to achieve in that context? And finally, uh, Donald Tyson, who is a really interesting guy, he, uh, he, he contributes a, a, probably the second longest essay in the book where he's written a ton about grimoire magic and um, all sorts of stuff like H.P. Lovecraft, <laughs> magical systems and things like this. And he, uh, his, his, he kind of traces the history of some of these esoteric groups, and but particularly what he, his argument is is how a um, how in order for initiation to work within this setting, it must involve uh, contact with non-physical beings, namely spirits. 
So that's quite a long ways from the uh, probably where the book starts. But that was also the point to kind of go from one end to the other. Yeah, that's it's fascinating. Um, so I'm curious of your impressions on working with the different authors and the different articles and subject matter. Well, um, most, not most, well, yeah, probably most of them are friends of mine um, to some extent, or at least co colleagues, or some of them are angel knows or colleagues of angels. A couple of them, I think, are cold calls also. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, it was really um, a great experience overall. I mean, editorial work can be, well, it can be uh, kind of tedious. I'm, I'm a Virgo, though, so I, I tend to do well with this this tedious aspect of editing, um, but you know it's it's also exciting of like develop getting the idea from the author, seeing if they will will contribute, and they get excited, and then they send in their essay. And the only part of that sometimes, you, even though I didn't have this problem here, but sometimes if you want to make big changes or there's something wrong with it, then and you go back to the author and they're like, oh, I don't want to change this or. But in this case, I did have some things I wanted to change on several of them. And um, and for the most part, the authors were um, very accommodating and they were all excited about it. And it was really just a, um, a good experience. And even with, with my essay, I sent, or my introduction, I sent that to Angel and he looked it over and he gave me a couple of important uh, editorial comments also. So it was all, it all seemed to, to work quite well and um, it was a lot of fun. Excellent. I'm curious uh, is this I, it's really pretty an eclectic group of uh, of writers here in this collection yeah and it's pretty wide ranging but mm -hmm. um, the material does kind of flow together really well. I think in the, the major points, uh, it's, it's like you can totally see the how it it all fits. So that that's really good to hear. That's good to hear because we were a little worried whether or not that would it would turn out like that. Yeah, it definitely seems very coherent to me. So like uh, they belong together in a collection. So I'm I'm glad that it feels that way. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. And we also, you know, look forward to more of your writing and uh, Masonic research as well, because it's just, we only touched on the one uh, article, but you have several others that you've put out and they're all tremendously well-researched and well-written. So I know that uh, if anybody enjoyed this conversation, you're going to enjoy, they're going to enjoy all of your writing. So definitely check it out. Yeah, and I just want to say that I really appreciate you having the time here to talk with you. And I've been listening to this show, as I mentioned, for 10 years. So it's just like the culmination of a, of a long journey to be here and to chat with you. And so it was really great. Yeah, thank you. It was a thrill for me as well, because I know you've been a listener and supporter of the show. And I appreciate that a lot. And I, I know people who like the show also appreciate that a lot. And to have watched you grow as a uh, writer and a researcher and a presenter, uh, and now as an editor and uh, involved in the publishing process, and it's just great. Uh, and I, I wish you all the success in the world. It makes me really happy to see it, and uh, I'm just excited for whatever's next. Yeah, thank you so much, and to you as well. Thank you. In the Chamber of Reflection, Jedediah French and I continue with the second half of this interview by discussing his research into the Asiatic Brethren, Sabbatean Frankism, Lurianic Kabbalah, and high-degree European Freemasonry. Apparently, the Asiatic Brethren was largely responsible for the reintroduction of Kabbalism into Western esotericism via ritual degree lectures and possibly angelic workings. A notable and important link between antinomian Jewish 
and Christian fraternal esotericism. Next, we delve into the potential differences between ancient and modern initiation to determine what might be the factors to increase the likelihood that initiations be the reality-shattering events that they have the potential to be. Listen to that exclusive recording at chamberofreflection.com. And I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. Thanks again for listening and until next time.